tonight using this amateur telescope here I am going to attempt to capture the Spaghetti Nebula which is a supernova remnant the remnants of a star that died in the past and the kicker is that I am in Tokyo with a lot of light pollution but that nebula is super super faint so it will uh, take a lot of trickery to hopefully be able to capture it from Tokyo now this nebula is a very interesting nebula because it is absolutely massive. It is huge. In terms of angular diameter, it is three degrees across. As a point of comparison, the moon is half a degree across. So you could fit in just the length of the nebula, although it's almost like a spherical shape, six moons put next to one another. And yet that nebula w was only first discovered in 1952 because it is so faint. And even now in our night sky, there are probably millions, maybe not millions, but so many nebulae that we haven't discovered simply because they're too faint or we haven't spent enough time imaging that particular region of the sky. And that is what is so exciting with amateur astrophotography, with astrophotography in general, even if you don't discover something, you're rediscovering or discovering for yourself. I absolutely love this concept. So what will I be using? What techniques and what material will I be using to beat the infamous Tokyo light pollution and capture this image of such a faint target that it wasn't discovered until 1952 despite its massive size? It's this. And the biggest piece here is the mount it will be used to track the nebula as it moves across the sky because the earth rotates and we need to counter that rotation this mount together with what is called an auto guiding system will be able to track the uh, target extremely precisely and this is critical because I will be taking long exposures of the target specifically tonight I'll be taking five minute exposures and my next tool and next weapon is this blue thing here this blue thing is the astrophotography camera that I'm using. If you've taken photos at night with your phone camera or even a DSLR you've noticed that in the shadows there's likely a lot of noise. Some of that noise is thermal noise because as electricity runs through the sensor effectively it heats the sensor up and the sensor will effectively mistake the Excita excitation of the atoms due to the heat, it will mistake it for actual light that hit the sensor, very roughly speaking. So this camera here has a black vent and this black vent is a fan exhaust because it is cooled via what is called a Peltier cooler and tonight I will be cooling the sensor of the camera to minus 10 degrees Celsius uh, whereas the ambient temperature right now is around 10 degrees Celsius. So that's my second weapon to remove as much as I can from the noise sources that I can control. I cannot control light pollution and I cannot control the target being very faint, but I can control the thermal noise from the camera and this is what I'm going to do. But the biggest piece of the puzzle is actually hidden in here. In here is this little piece of glass. This is a filter and it is made to let in only two very specific slivers of color of light. And it so happens that those slivers of color of light are exactly what the nebula we're attempting to capture emits. So the, the nebula is made of hydrogen atoms and of oxygen atoms. And when excited in just the right way, those atoms start to emit light and in two very specific color. One is a blue-green color for oxygen and one is red for uh, hydrogen, at least for the part of hydrogen emission, uh, emissions that we are attempting to capture. Because this filter only lets in those two colors, it manages to reject all of the light pollution that is not specifically of those two colors. Now, of course, in Tokyo, a lot of the light pollution is LED and LED have a very wide spectrum. So they are, it's active in all colors. So we still let in the light pollution, but we can reject like 99% of it, which is a huge help. But even rejecting 99% of the light pollution in Tokyo is not enough. And so what do we do to counter that? The answer is deceptively simple. As I mentioned, I was going to take five minute exposures of the target. And that means that the mount needs to track extremely precisely for the uh, exposure to not have uh, trails on the stars because the uh, something moved during the exposure. So if I take one five minute exposure, 
okay, I'm gonna see something. But if I take many five minute exposure, what I can do is that I can do a process that is called stacking. It's effectively just like put, putting them all on top of one another and taking the average. When we do that, we average all like signals and noise in the image and it will make it easier for me to remove the light pollution gradient. And at the same time, I'll be having uh, more a better average signal from the target that I am attempting to capture which means that my signal to noise ratio which is really what I'm after I want more signal less noise will increase the more exposures I manage to stack so really I'm going to play the long game we're gonna take several hours of data with this telescope stack everything and then see what the results is before I get started I need to put this on the telescope and this is because, again, here in Tokyo, we have tons of buildings and stray light in the area. And so it could hit the uh, telescope itself and, and like it's not a good thing because we want to capture only the light pollution that is in the section of sky that we're attempting to uh, capture and nothing else. And let's take this show on the road. It has now, my mount has now started to automatically move to point to the target once it has pointed to the target it will automatically center it into our field of view and start taking exposures and i'll see you once i've managed to take those exposures and we'll go into revealing that faint faint nebula that was only discovered fairly recently now the problem with astrophotography is that it can be interrupted very easily by clouds ah! Uh, so I only got a couple of hours last night. Let's still see what the result looks like. So once you're done imaging, or at least over a single night, you get a list of files like here. Each of those files is a five minute exposure of the target. And if you look at a single of those frames, this is the type of stuff that we see, like stars and not much else. And so you might think just looking at the single exposure, there's no way that we can get more details than that. It's like there's too much light pollution from Tokyo. It's impossible. Let's just give up. But no, I have 28 of those frames for those couple of hours or so of data. And so I want to see if I stack average out those 28 frames, if I can get something better. And stacking frames is a very processor intensive process. You have many megapixels per photo and you want to average them all and do some statistics on them. There's a lot of very complex math going on, but it's all provided by software. A lot of it actually is free. I use paid software for this, but there's really good free software as well that lets anyone really do astrophotography, even with cheap equipment and cheap or even free software. And let's see the result of the stacking of 28 frame. Here it is. So immediately we can see that compared to the single frame, we can see some nebulosity. We can see some brains in space. They're not magnificent. They're not amazing, but they're there. And that is the most important for me. You can see details here, bulbous details here, here as well. There's a bit of blue green. There's some red as well. This looks quite delicious to me. So I'd say that overall, it looks like a very underwhelming result, but I see it as extremely positive because it shows me that I can actually image this uh, object from Tokyo, from this super light polluted city, because with just two hours, we can see some of the brains, some of the nebulosity already, which I find amazing. And what's really cool with astrophotography is that because most of the objects, like deep sky objects, they don't change at all across the years. You can accumulate data over days and nights, or mostly nights actually, and years as well, across several years if needed. And so that's what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna accumulate more data. And let's look, once it's done, at the result together. And so I ended up getting data on this target over five nights, five cloudless nights. And let me share with you the final results of those five nights from this super light polluted city that is Tokyo. Oh, oh, oh. 
if we look at the actual details of this image, if we zoom in, we can see there's many, many, many stars and stars can actually d distract from the uh, nebulosity. And we do have processes in astrophotography to using AI tools, get rid of stars. And so I did just that. This is the result of the image without the stars. And we can see very, very clearly the brains, the spidey split plate, the brains in space, the zombies in space type of image. I absolutely love this and I cannot believe that I was able to capture this in all of its glory. We know that this supernova, this exploded star, exploded so, such a long time ago because the uh, faintness, the dimness of the whole thing and how wide it has become. It's actually around 140 light years across. And from our point of view, as I was mentioning before, six full moons can fit into the diameter of this thing. I think it's absolutely mind boggling. And this is what I find amazing, absolutely amazing with astrophotography, revealing such objects. And I hope this video made you really realize the potential of the hobby if you liked it click the like button, leave a, a comment, subscribe, and if you feel especially generous, you may even join the channel using the join button at the top bottom right or even join my Patreon. With that, I hope this was interesting. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget, whenever you can, to look up at the stars, and I'll see you next time.